Right. I'm Vilnis Vesma. Welcome to this latest in the series of Energy Conversations. And I'd like to welcome my guest today, Joe O'Keefe. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about Joe in a moment. He's a former colleague of mine in the energy management consulting business who's since gone on to greater things. And working away in the background, my uh, colleague, uh, Daniel Curtis, is busy admitting people to the, uh, to the meeting. Daniel will be taking questions via the text chat facility during the course of the uh, of the talk so if anything occurs to you as joe is speaking that you'd like to ask if you could type it in through the text chat channel and then daniel will be in charge of relaying questions to joe once he's uh, finished the uh, once we've finished the the chat so uh, yeah welcome joe um now none of you would know joe i i i would i would imagine so uh, these days, uh, the great things that he's gone on to is he's IT service director at LV, uh, Liverpool, Victoria and General Insurance Company. I think is probably something like the, the real name of it. Um, right. he'll, he'll, he'll fill in the details more precisely himself. But the reason why uh, Joe's career is going to be of interest to us is that for two years, he was head of transformation and government governance uh, in the IT uh, wing of LV and uh, having worked for quite a long time before that on process change and we're going to be uh, reflecting on his journey through making people change the way they behave and changing corporate culture. So Joe if I can uh, kick off uh, I'll be the first thing I'd like to do is to ask you to tell us candidly if you can about some of the behaviors that you've had to change the lv during your time there and um, how you went about doing it okay um thanks Phil. listen hello everyone um it's good to be here so i think I'll, it will be useful to talk about one of the um kind of programs of work that i undertook as head of transformation and governance at lv um back about three and a half years ago now. So we set up a programme, it was called Change for Brilliance, and it was the, the sole intention of it was to um, change the ways of working of the IT function. So looking from what was a very traditional business, um, very conservative ways of working uh, in terms of running projects in a waterfall way, making sure that um, you were... Sorry, no one. Uh, did you say no waterfall? Waterfall, yes. Waterfall yeah. is, a, is a development methodology where you do things in a sequential way. So you define your requirements, you then get a, a business analyst to run through those requirements and make sure that they are what you build them into a functional process and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and it, the, the end is a delivery. So you, you, if you think about, I suppose, if you think about Waterfall and Agile as the two methodologies I'm going to talk about, you... It, following either you were if you were to build a motorway following either you'd get a motorway but um in um in waterfall you'd plan it all and then build it all in one go and in agile you'd build it in 10 meter chunks at a time um agile allows you to be more efficient in terms of delivering it functionality um so we had these very traditional groups of people so we'd have a group of developers and a group of testers and a group of business analysts and a group of um technicians from a database perspective or, or whatever, all of whom would work in silos and not really collaborate together in order to come up with the right answer. So we built a program of work um, and we set up workshops and, and uh, you know, went to a huge amount of effort, spent a lot of money in, in order to get them to build cross-functional teams, in order to uh, build communities of practice and in order to build better ways of interacting as groups in order to deliver the, um, the, the outcome that we were after. Um, and, and I wanted to reflect really on how we went about building that program, because I'll come to whether we were successful or not at the end, and, and success is a subjective matter, I suppose. But we started by pitching our idea to um, an executive board uh, in order to achieve buy-in and of course that led to that group of people 
wanting to influence the, the, the kind of deliverables that we were going to come up with and the outcomes that we were after. And we then um, got given a, you know, fundamentally told who our stakeholders would be and we would have to go and seek the um, ideas of our stakeholders and the permission of our stakeholders to interact with their people. Um, so were you kind of losing control a bit at that point? Well, I think you, uh, there's an element of that. Yes, I mean, this is a very traditional process for, for kind of setting up a project in a, in a reasonably sized corporate. Um, and there's always a huge number of um, interested parties, I suppose. So you, you have to go through this process. Um, and you end up with a, a program of work where you've got a project plan and, and all of those other things and some desired outcomes. And, um, you know, I was trying to be, or we as a group, were trying to be incredibly inventive. I, uh, I engaged with some external third parties, some really progressive development companies. And I actually set up a series of workshops in a, in a really funky space in London and took the whole development team down there to see a different way of working, to see how um, this very, it's a company called Pivotal, uh, if anybody's interested, and how they worked and how they went about delivering value in in little chunks so that you could build up um to a to a, a, a product much more quickly and as soon as you took your eye off that group of people they would start reverting to their old ways of uh, of working and and you'd focus over here and there would be you know it, it was just impossible to keep control of it all and it struck me, so I, I, I suppose I can come to the, the denouement now, which is, were we successful? Not, not terribly. We spent a lot of money, we put in a huge amount of effort, and we changed the organisation very little in terms of the uh, kind of attitude and behaviours that we wanted to see, which was much more collaborative and much more broadly uh, operating as a single organisation. I, I, I don't know how many people on the call work in a reasonably sized corporate with an IT function, but there, there's always traditionally been the, the business and IT. And I was trying to create an organization where that, um, that differentiation wasn't there. Uh, well, what, was, what was driving the, the need to do this? Was it something that was mission critical to the business or, uh, or was it just, what, what was the imperative? Uh, the, yes, I suppose the, the imperative is, was that uh, we weren't terribly efficient in terms of the delivery of change. Um, and if we marked ourselves against our competitors, we were slower to market. And um, in, uh, again, general insurance is an incredibly competitive business in the UK. And if you, if you come second in delivering to a marketplace, then you don't generally do very well. Um, and, and actually, we needed to be faster to market in terms of you must all see insurance adverts, but you know, multi-cover whereby an insurance company will cover your car and your house okay. on the same policy and things like that. It's important to have that offering in place quickly. And if you don't, then you lose. Yeah. Okay. Any other kind of change programs that you had on any other aspect? Um, so there are, uh, there are many, but probably smaller scale. So in terms of looking at the change in um, the way, so uh, along with the, the description you've given of, the, of my role, I also have always looked after kind of service delivery functions. So helping to ensure that people understand their part in that process. So if you're looking after an application, for example, uh, a really good example. In fact, so I worked on a, a process whereby there was a change undertaken to a particular system that always went wrong. Um, and every time it went wrong, it was costing about hundred thousand pounds in lost revenue. And I'd speak to the people and I'd find out what had gone wrong and I'd build a new part of the process to stop that thing going wrong uh, the next time. And the next time there would be another thing that went wrong. And we went round this merry dance for about Three, three, three or four months, and I would be hauled up in front of, uh, okay. in front of my big boss yep. to uh, explain why. And eventually, I realised that that actually the way to fix this was to explain to the person who was making the change what it was they were doing and what the impact of that. Now that was a, a massively successful change. So I went and spoke to the team, and I said, "Every time you do this, it's costing a hundred thousand pounds." And they went, "Well, I had no idea." 
Okay. And then they took more care and it was fine. So right. um, I, I don't know if that's the kind of thing you're after, but... Uh, well, I'm kind of interested to, in to know, you know, to, what works and, and what doesn't. Um, well, so, so yes, okay. So, and that's a very direct question. So uh, I think having, um, so if I, if I reflect on my current experience, which is um, on the, uh, about the 3rd or 4th of April, I was given the challenge of getting the entire organisation of LV General Insurance to work from home. That's about 3,600 people all of whom worked out of an office. We had a capability as an organization for about 400 people to work from home. Um, and, you know, clearly there are a number of change factors that are involved in that. You've got, a, you know, 2,200 of, of our people are contact center staff who take calls from customers and they're used to coming into the office, switching on a computer, uh, picking up a phone and working for seven hours and then turning off their computer and going home. And we had to get from there to a position where we could run all of our telephony in a voice over IP way over a VPN connection to get all of those people able and capable to use a laptop working from home. And did, I mean, were people resistant to doing that? Or? Well, no, because there was no, <laughs> there was com compulsion, wasn't there? There was no other option. And right. I think if, if you're looking at, um, uh, uh, in terms of, delivering change, actually having that imperative is the, the key thing that helps you to be successful in that regard. So I was given the challenge, but I was also given almost completely free reign to make it happen without having to, um, fr frankly, without having to tread nicely around other people's um, concerns or desires in that space. So it was we need to be able to work from home. We need to be able to service our customer base. We need to be able to, you know, uh, take claims for, for um, vehicle damage and house damage and all of those things because uh, the regulator says we have to. And if we don't, then we're, we're going to be in big trouble. So there was, we went from my first example where by the, the organization thinks about a change that it wants to make and it thinks about it in terms of how it looks in the marketplace and um, how it compares with its competitors to a place where you have to make a change because there absolutely is no other alternative um, and you deliver those things in a very different way and okay so i mean supposing you'd had to make this change uh without a pandemic but uh, so you know if the company had just decided <laughs> we want to um cut our carbon footprint by closing all our offices yes uh, could you do you think you could have done it without so, that I, I, I've reflected on that a lot actually and I've spoken to quite a number of my um, my colleagues and peers and I think if so I'll, I'll, I'll speak in general terms and in numbers so these are slightly commercially sensitive I suppose so please don't go wildly yes. sharing them about but I think uh, but, but hang on, we are being recorded Joe well, I that's have to... fine it's fine I'm not I'm not breaking any any rules particularly I think if um, except in a specific way, except in a specific and, uh, and limited, yeah, absolutely, limited fashion. <laughs> um, so I think if we had run this up as a project, we would have spent two and a half years and probably 30 million pounds in delivering a home working capability, uh, going through the processes that I outlined in that first um, example that I gave. And the actuality was we did it in four months and it cost about five million pounds. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, in ter I mean, when we're thinking about the energy management business, it really says uh, we've got to find some way to make saving energy mission critical for people. But I mean, that's just my, my take on it. But if it, I, what I want to come round to is obviously you've uh, been res responsible for changing culture and changing people's behavior and you've done it through sort of touchy feely ping pong um, table gate yes. friendly consultative ways and you've held a, a gun to people's heads and said over there do it over there so has anything changed in the way you would approach discretionary changes in the future or changes that people see as discretionary in the future as a result of your recent experience without a shadow of a doubt so uh, one of the things that uh, as a result of the work that um, 
I and my team have undertaken to get LV to where it is now was to say, actually, we've taken a, a, a huge leap forwards in terms of the agility of the organization um, and our ability to cope with kind of stress situations. Um, and it would be incredibly foolish to throw that away or to not follow up and to take further action. And so a, a program of work has been, <laughs> has been built on the back of it. Uh, which is being called virtualization, so organizational virtualization. And I'm already beginning to see, because I'm involved in that from a um, technology perspective, I'm already beginning to see some of those behaviors creeping in, and I am immediately um, A, alerting people to the fact that, it, you know, if we go down that path, we'll be five years and 20 million pounds down the line before we achieve anything. But also encouraging people to think about how you can inject that imperative so we, we got a very clear signal from our chief executive who is a, a very forward-thinking guy and he said i want the organization to be able to work in a martini style which is you know if you're old enough anytime any place anywhere um with their with their advertising campaign so people should be able to work from where they choose to work from without impediment really um, and that's a very strong and a simple statement and already we have teams of project managers who are creating um, complexity around that very simple statement. And I think that's, that's the thing that I would take away is if you have a single minded, single view that is simple and you follow through on it, then actually you can keep that focus and that imperative going. Whereas as, as soon as you start injecting complexity, because, uh, thinking back to my first example, one of the issues we had was there are a raft of people in a big corporate organization who's, who feel that their livelihood is threatened by the change that you are um, proposing. And actually, if, if you think like that, then you immediately become a barrier to the change. I, I, I coined the phrase the frozen middle when I was, um, when I was undertaking that previous piece of work. And it makes it incredibly difficult because overcoming that, that sort of inertia of to, to make the change stick and happen is incredibly difficult. And if you can create an organizational construct whereby those people understand that, that by relinquishing this thing that actually you can go on and do something more interesting or, you know, being honest about the, the prospects of, of, of those people as well. Actually, you, you generate more um, more ability to make change stick, and also you you maintain that compulsion. The reason, the initial reason that you came up with for for making the change in the first place, and and if you get to a place where that has been watered down through the process, actually, I think that's where you have to stop and reevaluate and and go okay. back. And, yeah, I we'll just. Um interrupt for a moment i'm just going to ask everybody on the call or anybody on the call if you've got a question relating to the kind of lessons on uh, motivation uh, and culture change that joe can answer um type them in through the text chat i've had half an eye on the questions that have have come in and there's some questions here which uh possibly not quite on that uh, on that target but just to paraphrase Joe if I may just to kind mm -hmm. of understand what what you're saying if we're trying to get an organization's employees to work in a <clears throat> in a more energy conscious way it would help if we could express some kind of concrete vision of where everybody was going and I, I talk about a concrete vision so that we paint a mental picture for people about what life at this place of work will be like in five years time mm. and that then becomes the kind of unifying goal that that is the the center of gravity for life that pulls everybody's attention back to or the magnetic pole that pulls everybody's attention back to the original objective yes um, yeah yeah i would i would absolutely agree and i think again <laughs> coming on to uh, you know your point earlier about uh, limited and uh, limited ways of breaking the law i suppose 
it is actually it's that the, the simplicity of the statement. So if you if you've got a simple thing, and you've got a vision that is associated with that simple thing, then I think you can probably come to a place where you have that. You can create that compulsion, the reason to create the compulsion to make people behave in a particular way. But I think if you have to go through, you know, fourteen committee stages and you're you've got to deal with, you know, I don't know, 30 or 40 interested stakeholders who are going to want their piece of that action, then it becomes much more difficult. So uh, it is hard because, you know, that's the way organisations always work. And you know, as I said earlier, we've been, we've been acquired by Allianz. And as I start to look into the Allianz organisation, there are 120,000 people worldwide. It is a behemoth. And you, you can see these things writ large throughout, but then you see within that, you see kind of these oases of um, people getting on and getting stuff done and making change, despite, I suppose, despite that juggernaut of, uh, of organizational construct that you have to get through. And it, when you look at those changes, it is because they are, they have a simple purpose and they have created that need uh, which drives through everything else that uh, that comes around okay right i i've just there's uh, we haven't had many questions but there's just one come up from uh, john mulholland who's asking were the changes joe described pre-covid well ob obviously the you know the home working was post-covid but ha what, what about the, the rest of the examples you've given? There? Yeah, so every, everything else, yes, I, th I think planning for, you know, COVID is a great, is a great um, driver of change, I suppose. So yes, the others were pre-COVID. And, and I think, if I think about the reason for that question, I think it's a really good one, which is that COVID did create the imperative for change without a shadow of a doubt. And somebody, um, somebody asked me, I was uh, on, on a call with a group of, transformation people and they said asked me what the greatest driver of digital transformation within lv had been and this was a i'm talking this was probably in may or early june and the only answer i could give was the, the global pandemic it has driven more change and more transformation through organizations than anything else ever there's, yeah. there's absolutely no doubt yeah uh daniel if i could um ask you i, th I think i've seen a uh, at least one question come in since the one I, I brought in from John. Can you just um, ask, read that out to Joe, please? Um, yes, we've got, we've got one here. Um, any thoughts on how to dr drive change as a, as a low level employee and persuade convin or con and convince managers that current processes could be improved? And then also from the other side as a manager, what sort of feedback communication from people below you was the most valuable or, or convincing? Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. And it is tough, actually, sitting um, <laughs> lower down in an organisation and seeing the need for change, but being feeling unable to drive it, I suppose. And in, it's difficult to answer that question because I suspect it is different in all organisations, but... Uh, my advice, I suppose, would be to find someone um, in, a, in a more senior position who shares or you can persuade to share your view. Um, because it's that, if you, can, if you can get that person to see the need and the, the reason for that change and why it's important, then you're more likely to get a hearing. But um, uh, also, pr presumably, if it's in their personal interests as well. So yes. if you come up with an idea, if I could just chip, chip in, actually, with an example that um, came to me from somebody that, that came on a, a behavior change workshop. Uh, one of the lessons that, that, that I, people took away was if you want something, go and ask for it. Yes. So she went to her finance director and said, look, I, I think that we should spend some money on this energy saving project and the finance manager um, basically bit her arm off and said brilliant because I'm looking for ways to save money and you've just given me something that could answer that that need yeah yeah indeed so it's, it's that shared 
shared vision and shared desire is is important. Now, the the, the other part of that question was um, seeking or listening to the views of those who you're managing, and and again, that's hugely important. So I I took if again if I give the example of getting everyone working from home, it, it it's a really interesting point actually because if you look at the organization now in terms of who has the focus of the executive of the organization it isn't the middle management it isn't um you know the senior team it is the guy who's taking the telephone call from our customer because that's what's important now and when you're in the office that's in, it's an easy deliverable and when you're not in the office it's a it's a really difficult thing to do so all of the focus is on delivering great service to probably our, our lowest paid and um, least experienced team. And that's, that's very different. That is not a normal situation to be in. So, so actually, I, I am absolutely driven by delivering great service to those guys, because without doing that, the, the organisation will really struggle. Okay. Uh, Daniel, but time for one more, maybe? Yeah, sure. We've got one from Adam Gravely here. Um, what's your theory of change? Is there anything about it that leads you to an agile approach? Ah, oh, so uh, yeah, so it's a really interesting question. And uh, so for me, I think there are there are programs of work where agile is absolutely the right answer, and there are programs of work where it isn't. So we recently um, undertook a the delivery of an, a, a brand new system of record change. So the the system that we keep all of our customer records and all of their policy documents on. And actually delivering that as a piece of agile delivery would be almost impossible because it's so huge and there are so many moving parts that you have to get to exactly the right answer on exactly the right date. So agile doesn't tend to be functional delivery on a date. So you can, you can slip story points between sprints and so on and so forth. So um, I think it's the right answer for a lot of stuff, but not for everything. Okay, Joe, thank you. Just one final question from me. Mm -hmm. um, are you completely self-taught in uh, these so, matters? <laughs> yes, is the answer to that. So, uh, but all experience is useful, isn't it? So as throughout my career, the th things that have been really interested, interesting to me have been those, the interfaces between the IT change and the cultural change that's required to back that IT change up. So, um, I've been interested in it and I've read around it, but I don't have a formal qualification, no. Okay, well, seems like you've done well. Um, well, we're pretty much to the end, at the end of the half hour. So Joe, I know you've got another meeting to get off to. So thank you very much indeed for um, the insights that you've provided through the, the work within the context that, uh, that you're involved with. I'd like to thank Daniel behind the scenes um, letting people in and then fielding the, uh, the questions and relaying them. Um, and thank everybody who tuned in and attended. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Goodbye for now. Thanks, Phil. Goodbye. Bye, Joe.